This episode of Ghost Town may contain disturbing or graphic descriptions, which may not be suitable for all audiences. Please use discretion while listening. Thou shalt not kill. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. some history with Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is, at about five minutes outside of Philadelphia, more Philly than Jersey. My uncle, an Orthodox Jew, found a close-knit community there, and he lived with that community for over 30 years. One day, I asked him about a case I was working on, and he remembered literally every detail immediately. Why? Because this case rocked the Cherry Hill community then and even now. It centers around cake mogul Carol Newlander and involves the Philadelphia Inquirer, a predatory rabbi, a local radio DJ, a prosecutor's office conspiracy, the Jewish special forces, and even the mob. Today, we're talking about the death of Carol Newlander. Around 9 p.m. on November 1st, a panicked 911 call comes into the Cherry Hill PD from a man named Fred Newlander. Newlander tells the dispatcher that his wife, Carol, is, quote, on the floor covered in blood. Responding officer Richard Bombera quickly arrives at 204 Highgate Court and enters the front door of Newlander's home. There he finds himself in the once pristine all-white living room, but the white walls, white carpets, and white furniture are all awash in blood. Blood also pools on the floor underneath the victim, Carol, who appears to have been assaulted with a blunt object. Head in hands, Fred Newlander sits outside on the curb as more law enforcement, including detectives Marty Devlin, Joe Metterly, and Richard Rubluski, flood the Newlander house. Devlin notes that, despite the bloody scene, Fred Newlander's own clothes appear clean. Soon the EMTs arrive. Among them is 21-year-old Matthew Newlander, who is recognized as the son of the victim inside. It's a nightmare come to life. After responding to a call at his own address with directives to treat a, quote, bleeding victim, Matthew is desperately trying to get inside his own house. Acting quickly, other EMTs grab Matthew and sit him next to his father. Devlin has Rubluski take both Newlanders to the station for questioning, while Carol is pronounced dead inside the house. Detective Devlin surveys the scene, noticing family photographs, stylish furniture, the mezuzah on the side of the front door. The Newlanders seem to be a typical Cherry Hill family leading a blessed life. But the Newlanders' affluence makes Devlin wonder if the homicide did begin as a robbery, though there's no overt evidence of a break-in. The house seems intact. There are no signs of forced entry, and no valuables are missing. At the station, police question Fred and Matthew Newlander, starting with Fred. Fred Newlander said he'd been married to Carol since 1965, and in 1968, the two moved to Cherry Hill for a rabbinical job at a nearby temple. In 1974, Newlander founded his own reform congregation, Makor Shalom. The temple quickly gained popularity, but building a synagogue from the ground up while raising three children, Rebecca, Benjamin, and Matthew, didn't stop Carol from pursuing her own dreams. In 1982, she started Classic Cakes, her own kosher bakery. It was a huge success, with branches opening all over Philadelphia and New Jersey. Fred also talks glowingly of his relationship with Carol. He tells Devlin that they had a great marriage and were still very much in love. When asked about the events of that night— Fred says Classic Cakes had administrative meetings every Tuesday evening until around 8 p.m., after which Carol had a weekly phone call with her daughter, Rebecca. Fred himself had just come home from a late night at McCor Shalom when he encountered his wife on the ground and called 911. Matthew Newlander gives investigators much of the same information, until he's asked about his parents' relationship. Matthew says the two were in a bad place, and he'd walked in on them fighting just days before. Already, Matthew and Fred Newlander's stories don't align. Devlin decides to monitor both, in addition to collecting the family's phone records. After questioning Carol's business partners, Judy Stern and Lynn Rothenberg, Devlin and his team confirm Carol's evening activities. Stern and Rothenberg add that after their administrative meetings, Carol would come home with the company's cash receipts, ranging from ten dollars to $20,000. Devlin realizes that it's highly probable that the killer knew Carol and her routine. Someone could have easily followed her home and collected their own illicit reward. Another discovery at the Newlander house leads the investigators back to the theory of a robbery gone wrong. Carol's purse is missing. Though there are still no signs of forced entry, investigators find minute signs of struggle, carpet impressions of a chair being moved, and a statue knocked off the mantle. While no weapon is found at the scene, blood samples are collected and the area is dusted for prints. 
Eventually, Carol's body is taken to the medical examiner's office to be autopsied. Assistant Rabbi Gary Mazo and Cantor Anita Hockman at McCor Shalom confirm Fred Newlander was at the temple that night. At the same time, Rebecca and Benjamin Newlander are informed of their mother's death and rush home to Fred and Matthew. Devlin is eager to question Rebecca. He knows from Fred and Matthew that Rebecca and Carol talked Tuesdays around 8 p.m., which means Rebecca likely spoke to her mother minutes before she was killed. When questioned, the information that the Newlander's oldest child shares is haunting. Rebecca says she was on the phone with her mother at 8.15 p.m. on the 1st, when her mom's doorbell rang. Carol told her daughter that a delivery man had arrived and that she had to go. Rebecca asked her mom if she wanted her to stay on the phone while the delivery man was inside of the house, but Carol said no, that she knew him. He had been there at the same time on October 25th to, de- to deliver an envelope, a, quote, message for the rabbi. Because of their scheduled call, Rebecca was also on the phone with her mother the week before when Carol first encountered the delivery man, who at that point asked to use the bathroom and dropped off the aforementioned message, which was, strangely, just a blank envelope. Though Rebecca didn't think much of it at the time, she knows that in both instances her mother was in grave danger. Taking this important information in, Devlin realizes that this case hinges on the identity of this mysterious delivery man. Find the delivery man, solve the case. Fourteen hours after Carol's body is found, Cherry Hill PD and Camden County District Attorney Edward Borden hold a press conference. Not much is said about Carol's murder, aside from asserting that it is a burglary gone wrong, and that there are strong potential suspects. Carol Newlander's murder is the first and only homicide of 1944, and Cherry Hill is in absolute shock. To cover their bases, detectives call every local delivery service in the phone book. Unsurprisingly, not one had a delivery scheduled to the Newlander home on October 25th or on November 1st. Next, Devlin looks into potential suspects Daniel and Frank Spanolia, area criminals paroled from state prison about two months before. The brothers had orchestrated a series of similarly executed burglaries in the past, gaining access to a home and making out with valuables. The autopsy report supports the theory of an assault and robbery by an experienced criminal, or criminals. It also shows that Carol Newlander had been struck seven times on the head with a blunt object. No outside fingerprints and no blood beyond Carol's is found at the scene. As the Spinolia brothers are being tracked down, other tips are being pursued, namely that Joseph Merlino, a reputed Philadelphia mobster, may have been tied up in the rift between the rabbi, a conservative, and the staunchly democratic board of nearby Cooper Hospital. In addition, murmurs of Russian mafia swirl among the 2,000 people at Carol's funeral service, held two days after her murder. While these loose ends don't give Devlin much more information, Fred Newlander's phone records do. More after the break. Hi, hello, how are you? Hello. How are you doing? How's it going? Good. Uh, You're always surprised when I ask them how they're doing. Yeah. I care. Yeah. You don't think I care? I care. I care. I'm a caring person. We want to say to hello. We want to say hello to anyone who's listening, supporting us, spreading the good word of Ghost mm. Town. Mm. We thank you. Thanks. We thank you. Thank you, you thank very you much. Real good. And and heartily from our hearts, heartily. We want to say hello to our government. What's up with the mayors? <laughs> What's up, mayors? <laughs> It's March Madness, and Whoa. they're losing their minds. Whoa. They're like, it's March. It's Damn. time for me to lose my mind and then take 11 months off. That's right. This mayor absolutely loses it when she sees people she knew from back in the day that didn't age very well. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. <laughs> She's like, oh, mm-hmm. too bad. So sad. Wow. Ooh. I still look great, Good. baby. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, like, it's March Madness. She's allowed to do whatever she wants. That's right. That's Marissa Rothermel. Hello. This mayor absolutely loses her mind when a Rotten Tomato score is close to zero. Oh. Has no investment in the movie, mm-hmm. but it's just like. That's just anarchy, though. <laughs> zero close to zero? loves when just things crash things fall Mm -hmm. loves to see a movie take a nosedive with no investment in it Mm -mm. just loves the chaos yeah that's emma hopkins hello this mayor loses his mind when somebody buys something really expensive and they lose it like expensive (laughs) like airpods i mean that is madness and then they're just like oh you really studied you really shoved it in my face when you had it now it's gone, baby. Now it's gone. Now now you're back 
with the going back to find trying to find your old AirPods, mm-hmm, your old mm-hmm. crummy AirPods. I, uh, gummy and crummy. No one's more excited about it than Matthew Clemens Lorray. Hello. This mayor goes absolutely wild when somebody's walking around the mall and they're on their phone and mm. they're not looking in front of them and they just bump into something. <laughs> just bump right into something. Huh? They're like, what? <laughs> Did I just fall into this water fountain? Wow. What happened? Let me tell you who's there laughing all the way just for this month. That's Kelly Meehan. Hello. This mayor cannot get enough of when somebody posts an argument on social media, but they use the incorrect use of the word your. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is maddening. And just puts a little asterisk and then puts Ooh. the correct version of it and shuts down the whole argument. <sighs> it's madness. It's Kat Giselle. Hello. This mayor has an absolute glorious meltdown. She's driving and somebody cuts her off. Mm-hmm. No reason to do that. Mm-mm. Just driving like a nut. No. And then gets pulled over. Oh. Gets pulled over. Don't like to see the police except when that happens. Yeah. Especially yeah. on the road. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Loves it. It's mm-hmm. like, ha ha. It's called karma. It's March. It's you got madness. It. It's Ashley Matson. Hello. Now our governor. Mm hmm. Watches the world burn every <laughs> second from the skies. Champagne and coconut <laughs> water in hand. You heard champagne problems? There is no... <laughs> no. To say that to this person, they'd be like, that's What's just called problem? problems. Yeah. That's just called problems. Yeah. There is no champagne problems. There's always champagne. Yeah. Flowing. <laughs> there's champagne. Flowing from the there's skies. There's a passport. <laughs> <laughs> and to where? For what? Yeah. To who? Always... A mystery, mm-hmm. but loves just looking down and can see. Yeah, <laughs> can see that's part. It's part of the experience. Is mm-hmm. you could see just the rats mm-hmm. below, just claw, around for a scrap of nothing. Yeah, that's for right. a scrap of nothing. Looks at them. Nothing. Just Watch the them. rats, <laughs> <laughs> like rats in a maze, <laughs> not in first class with a Mm-mm. with a with a. A carafe of champagne, Mm-mm. a carafe of champagne, <laughs> just looking down, watching the world burn to death, <laughs> just for March, <laughs> and maybe extended. That's our governor, Avian, Avian Noble. Noble. No ads, no chit chat, bonus episodes, just the good stuff. Seven days free. Head on over to patreon.com slash ghost town pod. We do have an Apple podcast review. I, I saw I- that. I saw that. Yeah. I didn't click on it, but I saw it. <laughs> Why would you go the extra mile? Why would you invest I was a like, eh. second more All right. in, into Jason the world? Will, Jason will take care of it. Yeah. You know when like an office is like everyone leaves the office and it's like a mess and mm-hmm. they're like coming the next morning like, who well, clean this up? <laughs> That's me after go, when, yeah. time, when you're done recording. Yeah. You just leave it's your garbage sh- in the fucking floor, and you're like, chaos. Who's cleaning it up? And you take and all, you know, all the chaos, you put your computer and you shut your computer silently. You don't you, complain. You, you never, take it away and you just deal with it and then i just clean up yeah the mess it's true rebecca and jason have the right balance of funny and interesting information provided for each episode i love rebecca's use of intermittent swear words is it intermittent i think it's it's your constant it, or it's, what it's, it's, it's intermittent it's not intermittent. Inter, it's intermittent i mean i've i've calmed down <laughs> on have. it just because it seems like a lot sometimes when i'm editing i'm like oh okay. oh you're like oh <gasps> <gasps> Okay, it's just somebody like dropped the napkin in the in, in part of the episode. Mm, fuck, you're, 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 yeah. Coupled with Jason's non-use of them, it makes for a unique show every episode, and it's fun to hear the progression of the podcast since their debut. Mm-hmm. Back when I was in my early forties. Wow, what a great time! What was that like? I don't know. It was it was crazy. <laughs> we thought there'd be flying cars, but no. Wow. You guys make me laugh and wonder if it would be in the same setting. Mm. Kudos, kudos, kudos. Uh, it wouldn't, there'd be cursing. It yeah. wouldn't be intermittent. It'd be nonstop. Yeah. And it'd I mean, be like fried chicken. Yeah. Yum, yum. That's what I live for. That's what I'm fueled by. That's Esquire 13 mm. from the US and A. That's so cool. Let's get back to Cherry Hill. I'm very familiar. My brother lives in mm-hmm. Philadelphia. I go there twice a year to yeah, stand yeah. up, visit. So this is Your right in the house. pocket of, of a, a huge interest to me. Uh, yeah, unfo- yeah. Unfor- unfortunate circumstances. Well, if you have heard, uh, we've done a couple now Philadelphia episodes, I would say. It's because I am currently, I can't talk too much about it, but uh, working 
on a thing that has a lot of Philly cases and sometimes we get to use them. We're back in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And though the rabbi, Rabbi Newlander, has an airtight alibi on the night of his wife Carol's murder, his phone records show calls to many female congregants, including Robin Gross Rappaport. Devlin is surprised to see Sonsini's name. She is a household fixture in Philadelphia, a 20-year host of WPEN-FM Radio Philadelphia, one of the most popular stations in the area. When Rappaport is questioned, she reluctantly says that she's been having an affair with the rabbi. But when Sonsini is questioned, she denies any affair is going on. She tells Devlin that her husband died years before and that Newlander was just being a good rabbi, counseling her through her grief. Meanwhile, the Spaniola brothers are found in both their alibis check out. When Merlino and the board of Cooper Hospital are questioned, Devlin discovers that what feels like a lead is just an unsubstantiated rumor. To Devlin's surprise, on December 7th, 1994, Elaine Sonsini returns to Cherry Hill PD headquarters. Consumed with guilt, Sonsini admits that she did have an affair with Rabbi Newlander. She says she and Newlander had been seeing each other for years and met while her husband was in the hospital for cancer treatments. After leading her husband's funeral on December 13th, 1992, their affair officially began. By the end of 1993, Sonsini had joined McCor Shalom, and the two were calling each other five to ten times a day. Newlander and Sonsini were also engaging in almost daily sexual relations, both at Sonsini's home and in the rabbi's office at McCor Shalom. Tearfully, she said she gave Newlander an ultimatum, Carol or her. The rabbi said he promised it was her. With such a dangerous admission, ex-Cherry Hill PD officer Lawrence Leaf is assigned to guard and protect the high-profile radio host. Despite a relatively confidential investigation, Cherry Hill PD is frustrated to learn that someone at the Camden County Prosecutor's Office has been leaking details of the murder and the affairs to the media. While devastated, Newlander's congregants stand by their rabbi, now officially a suspect in what proves to be one of the strangest investigations in Cherry Hill history. The most outspoken of Newlander's supporters is Len Jenoff, a self-proclaimed ex-CIA gunman and currently freelance P.I., Jenoff met Newlander through McCor Shalom's weekly Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and the two became incredibly close. Jenoff is a larger-than-life personality, and most don't take his outlandish claims seriously. But when Newlander officially resigns as the rabbi of McCor Shalom on February 26, 1995, the Cherry Hill Police Department is forced to listen to Jenoff. To Devlin's dismay, Newlander has hired the bombastic veteran to be his official spokesman, who teases Carol Newlander's murder as the work of either a violent burglar or a Russian terrorist. On August 17, 1995, Philadelphia Inquirer journalist Nancy Phillips publishes an explosive expose on the case, saying that Carol Newlander was most likely killed by a hitman posing as a delivery man, masterminded by Fred Newlander himself. Shortly after, Fred Newlander holds his first and only press conference denouncing Phillips's story. Over the next two years, Devlin continues to investigate Carol's murder and the many players involved. But now Nancy Phillips is high on Devlin's radar, as is her relationship with her rumored sources, someone at the Camden County Prosecutor's Office and the extremely vocal Len Jenoff, who has courted, flirted, and kind of befriended Phillips after her piece in the Inquirer. After learning of Newlander's multiple affairs, Sansini broke it off with the rabbi and marries her bodyguard, Lawrence Leaf, who immediately cuts all ties with the Cherry Hill PD. Not long after, Devlin gets a tip that Leaf was going through the Camden County Prosecutor's Office files. Though he's never formally charged, Devlin believes Leaf might be the, quote, secret informant from the Prosecutor's Office leaking information to Phillips and the media. Meanwhile, when a good friend of Newlander's named Myron Levin comes forward, it seals Newlander's fate. Levin reluctantly tells Devlin that two weeks before the murder, the two were playing racquetball when Newlander solicited Levin for advice on how to, quote, get rid of Carol. With the help of this information, Fred Newlander is arrested on September 10, 1998. More years pass as Fred Newlander awaits trial. At this point, Devlin is assisting a new Camden County District Attorney named Lee Solomon with building a case against Newlander. On April 28, 2000, Devlin gets a call from Solomon, who invites him to come with him to a local diner. When they arrive, Nancy Phillips and Len Jenoff are there. Distraught, Jenoff confesses what he'd been telling Phillips for years under strict confidentiality, that he was paid $30,000 to kill Carol Newlander by none other than Fred Newlander, his closest friend and mentor. Jenoff says that the rabbi had befriended him when he was at his most vulnerable, a disgraced, divorced Jewish man struggling with alcoholism. Jenoff would do anything for the rabbi, and in early 1994, Newlander took him up on that, asking if Jenoff would, quote, kill an enemy of Israel. 
If Jenoff would kill a specific target, he said, the rabbi would pull some strings to get him a job with the Israeli secret police. Jenoff agreed and enlisted 26-year-old Paul Michael Daniels, a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic, a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic and Jenoff's former roommate, to kill Carol Newlander. In October of 1994, Jenoff and Newlander conceived of the plan and involved Daniels for added muscle. On October 25th, Jenoff and Daniels drove to the defendant's home wearing dark clothing and armed with a lead pipe. They knew when Carol would be home because of her administrative meeting, and while Daniels stayed in the car, Jenoff took a plain envelope to the Newlander house and asks to use the bathroom. Jenoff loses his nerve, gives Carol the envelope, and leaves. When Jenoff told Newlander what happened, he was enraged. Jenoff then promised to do it right the next week. On November 1st, Jenoff picked up Daniels, and the two parked around the corner from the Newlander house. Jenoff hid a lead pipe in his back pants pocket and walked to the front door with Daniels. Carol, preoccupied with her phone call with Rebecca, invited Jenoff inside, and he assaulted her with the lead pipe. Then Daniels came inside and finished the job, took her purse, and the two left. Jenoff tells Devlin and Solomon that he disposed of the bloody clothes and the murder weapon in a dumpster near the Cherry Hill Mall. After taking out $125, Jenoff then drove to downtown Philadelphia and disposed of Carol's purse in a dumpster. The next couple years, Newlander paid Jenoff the $30,000 under the guise of Jenoff being his spokesman and P.I., Two days after this explosive admission, both Len Jenoff and Paul Michael Daniels are arrested after Jenoff wears a wire and gets a confession from Daniels. While the person weapon are never found, on June 2nd, 2000, Jenoff pleads guilty to aggravated manslaughter and six days later, Daniels pleads guilty to aggravated manslaughter and robbery. On June 20th, 2000, Assistant Camden County Prosecutor James Lynch seeks the death penalty for Newlander, elevating his murder and conspiracy charges to capital murder, felony murder, and conspiracy. On October 15, 2001, the trial of Fred Newlander begins, with Newlander's children in tearful support of their father. On November 1st, seven years to the day of Carol Newlander's murder, the jury cannot reach a verdict. But this doesn't dissuade Solomon or Lynch from seeking justice. On October 15, 2001, the second trial against Fred Newlander begins, with the Newlander children now testifying for the prosecution. Witnessing hours of testimony about their father's life and their mother's demise, they realize that they do believe that their father is guilty. Len Jenoff pleads guilty to aggravated manslaughter and receives 23 years in prison. Paul Daniels pleads guilty to aggravated manslaughter and robbery and also receives 23 years in prison. On January 17, 2003, Newlander himself is found guilty of capital murder, felony murder, and second-degree conspiracy to commit murder and receives 30 years to life in prison. And another strange twist in this heartbreaking and bizarre case comes in 2022, when South Jersey's Jewish community is outraged yet again when the Geffen Theater here in Los Angeles, California, produced a full-length musical about the case, called A Wicked Soul in Cherry Hill, by Matt Schatz, an award-winning playwright and composer who grew up in South Jersey and was in high school when Newlander was killed. A Wicked Soul in South Cherry Hill was developed beginning in 2018 while Schatz was in residence at Geffen's new play program, The Writer's Room, and was advertised to the public as having, quote, humor and chutzpah. McCor Shalom President Drew Malotsky issued a statement about A Wicked Soul in Cherry Hill on behalf of the synagogue. On behalf of the synagogue, quote, we know nothing about the content of the play. This is our history. It involves our friends and our family, and it is very serious to us. To make light of it or to exploit it for entertainment value is not something we will ever condone. Matthew Newlander, now a doctor, also gave a statement about the play, saying that his family, quote, is saddened and dismayed to learn of the new Geffen Playhouse production, based on the story of my mother's cruel murder 27 years ago. The Geffen responded to the Cherry Hill community, saying that the play, quote, neither sensationalizes nor laughs at the tragic murder that took place in Cherry Hill. On the contrary, it is a piece that examines how a community moves forward when something horrific and heartbreaking shakes their faith. We recognize that our description of the play failed to convey this, yes it did, and it has been amended accordingly. Matt Schatz, who was raised in, again, South Jersey, has chosen to tell the story through song, and we believe that this play leads with heart. It paints a thoughtful, poignant portrait of a community that has suffered an incalculable loss. A complicated and heartbreaking situation that, of course, is fascinating to outsiders, but another reminder that, while fascinating and often a learning experience, we, and other forms of media, tell the story of real people and bear responsibility in doing so respectfully, thoughtfully, and with compassion and empathy towards anyone and everyone involved.
Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your jobs done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start, but now all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly, which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Listen up. I won't sugarcoat it. This is the longest cold flu and allergy season we've ever seen, but we're not alone. We've got Instacart. Sure, you may be a coughing snot faucet who just wants mommy, but you're not giving up. Not when cold medicine, fragrant herbal teas, and honey shaped like bears can be delivered through Instacart in as fast as 30 minutes. Now let's go win the sick playoffs! Daddy, I just want my soup. Oh, sorry, Sport App says it'll be here in, in a few minutes. <laughs> Instacart for the win. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> this is Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. I'm Steve Taylor, your host to a horror anthology podcast where we ask you to depart from your safe perception of reality to descend with us into the frightening depths and dark corners of twisted imaginations. With carefully curated original tales of terror each week, our deepest rooted fears are brought to the forefront by a diverse cast of voice talent and masterfully eerie sound design that bring these stories to life. We'll give you tales of unnerving encounters with the occult, harrowing hauntings, and sinister seances that show just how darkness knows no bounds. If you're like us here at Chilling Tales and enjoy feeling your stomach filling with dread as dastardly demons dance in your head, make sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe now to always be the first to enjoy the horror show. (laughs) 